We're getting sort of used to James. He tells it like it is. He's sort of a biblical Romaine, I guess. <laughs> you always knew where you stood, though you may not like to hear what he had to say, but yet it was always very straightforward. So in verse 4, James just comes right out and said, you adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. When God gave the commandments to Moses, the first of the Ten Commandments was, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He was to be supreme. There wasn't to be any other mastering force of your life. God was and wanted to be first. In that oft-repeated Shema of Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, Jehovah our God is one Jehovah, and thou shalt love Jehovah thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. God was to be first in your heart. Your love for him was to exceed all other loves. God looked upon the nation of Israel as his bride or his wife, sort of married unto Israel. And their love for God was to exceed and excel all of their other loves. The Lord said to Jeremiah, Go cry to Israel. I remember you in the kindness of your youth, the love that you had for me when we were engaged and when you followed after me in the wilderness in a land that was barren. But then God said, what did I do wrong? Where did I go wrong that that love that you once had for me is not there anymore? You remember as Jesus addressed the churches in the book of Revelation, the first church that he addressed was the church of Ephesus, a church that was really probably begun by Apollos, but then established by Paul. And the Lord told the church of all of the good things that they were doing and all of the positive traits that they had. But then the Lord said, I have this against you. You have left your first love. And all of those other things were really not as important as this issue. You've left that first love. As Israel was to the Father, so the church is to the Son. Married to God, Israel was not to have love for other gods or joined to other gods. And in God's eyes, that constituted adultery, spiritual adultery. What were the other gods that they were falling in love with and following after? Well, first of all, there was that God mammon that we read about. The love of money or the things that can be purchased with money. And how many people actually their possessions begin to possess them? And their possessions become the first and the paramount things in their life. And their possessions actually, their love for their possessions and their interest in their possessions their devotion to their possessions actually exceeds their devotions to the Lord. Ashtoreth, 
the goddess of sexual pleasures. And of course, again today, we see how so many people are mastered by their uh, desire for sex. Uh, it is interesting in um, the book, and oh, I, Lorraine Day, uh, her book on AIDS. Uh, she was a, uh, one of the chief uh, physicians at San Francisco Hospital uh, when the AIDS uh, virus became known and all, it was first of all called GRIDS, but she was so alarmed over this uh, deadly virus that she, and there, with being in San Francisco, they had so many in the hospital, she actually resigned and, and quit because uh, she just didn't want to take the chances of, of being infected by AIDS by treating uh, those who were there. But the interesting thing, she wrote this book and uh, how easy it is to transmit the AIDS virus and so forth, and how that, uh, in spite of that, there was all of this promiscuous homosexual sex that was going on in San Francisco, though they knew the chances of getting the virus were very high and they knew it was deadly. Uh, she remarked in her book that they loved sex more than they loved life. And uh, that's what God is talking about. When other things uh, your love for them exceeds your love for God. Uh, it, it is so overwhelmed by the desire for these things. Molech was another god of the Old Testament, the god of pleasure. And of course, there are so many today, again, who are worshiping this god Molech. And uh, it, God looks at that as, as uh, adultery, spiritual adultery. And thus, James is saying, you adulterers and adulteresses, uh, in your heart you have a love for these other gods. Baal uh, was, again, one of the major gods of the Old Testament. And, and the word Baal is just actually Lord, uh, but it is whatever it is that is the master of your life, whatever lords your life or rules your life, uh, that is... If that exceeds, you know, whatever it be, your love for God, then spiritually you were looked upon by God as uh, an uh, adulterer. God said to the prophet Hosea, Hosea, concerning Israel, I will visit judgment upon her, for she burned incense unto Balaam. And she decked herself with earrings and jewels, and she went after her lovers, and she forgot me, said the Lord. So uh, God's rebuke for the nation of Israel. To Isaiah, uh, for thy maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. So married unto God, in love with other gods, was spiritual adultery. God spoke to the people through Jeremiah in 320. Surely as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. So now coming over to the New Testament, where the church is known as the Bride of Christ, considered the Bride of Christ. And so in Romans 7, 4, Paul said, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God, married unto Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul said, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband 
that I might present you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. And so Paul's sort of being the father of the church in Corinth. And as the church there he has considered as his daughter. And in the marriage arrangement, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy uh, because I have want to present you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. In Revelation 19, 7, there in the heavenly scene, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Church, you, me, the bride of Christ. Our love for him should exceed all other loves. He should be first above everything else in our lives. You are not to really have any other lovers that would constitute spiritual adultery. So James is here talking to the church. But those in the church who are in love with the world and the things of the world. I believe that there is far too much worldliness in the church today. I think that many churches are sort of catering to worldly things using worldly methods to try to build the attendance, worldly methods to raise money. Uh, there are companies that you can hire across the United States that will come in and you tell them how much you want them to raise and of course uh, they, they raise funds for the church. It's a professional thing, but they use worldly tactics and all. And we've almost brought the world into the church. And, and we, we have made the church more of an entertainment center in many places rather than just a place to gather and worship God and study the word of God and draw close to God. John describes what the world is as far as biblical terms. He tells us, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For he that hath the love of the world in his heart hath not the love of the Father. And all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, they are of the world and not of God. Now, John tells us the world is going to pass away and the lust thereof. But he who does the will of God will abide forever. James just flat out tells us your friendship with the world is enmity with God. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. But that's one of the big problems today. People are trying to serve two masters. It is true that you do have one master, but you can't have two masters. Only one master passion in each of our lives, that passion that excels all other passions that we have. What is the dearest and the most important thing to you in your life? I want you to be careful how you answer that. I don't want just a, well, Jesus, of course, because that we have learned to just sort of, well, I love Jesus more than anything else. You know, I, I've said that from the time I was a small child. And that is sort of the expected response. But can you prove that by your life? By the thing that you're giving the most attention to and the thing that is really 
most important to you? Is it Jesus? Or are there other things, things of the world that uh, take precedent over your love for Jesus? Sort of like the fellow who called his girlfriend and he was telling her just how much he loved her. She was more important to him than anything or anyone else in the whole world. And if she were over in Europe, he would attempt to swim the Atlantic Ocean just to be by her side. He wanted so desperately to just be with her. If she were on the moon, he would endeavor to fly to the moon just to be with her. He can't stand being apart from her. He loves her so much. And incidentally, I'll be over to see you tomorrow night, providing it isn't raining, you know. And so uh, we, we say things, but then when it comes right down to it, a lot of times it, it, it's just words. It isn't really expressing the truth about me. So I may say, I love the Lord more than anything else in all the world. That's good, if it's true. But we need to examine our hearts, and that's not an easy thing to do, because uh, our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. And who can know them, the Lord said. And he said, I search the hearts. David said, you have searched me and you have known me. You know when I stand up, you know when I sit down. You know my thoughts before I think them. And David said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, I cannot attain it. What's he saying? I don't know myself. The knowledge of myself is, is something that I can't attain. Who was it, Socrates, that said, man, know yourself. But I'd like to suggest that that's probably the hardest bit of knowledge you'll ever have, the truth about yourself, because we are so prone to deceive ourselves. But if you ever really know yourself, not only will it be the hardest truth that you'll ever come to, but it'll probably be the most painful truth that you'll ever experience, to truly know yourself. So David, recognizing I don't know myself, God knows me better than I know myself, he ends that psalm by saying, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And that's what an honest person will do, a sincere person. Lord, I don't know. My heart is deceitful. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Put me through the test. Try me. Know my thoughts. See if there is some wickedness in me. See if there is some other God. See if there is some other love. See if there is some other thing that exceeds and excels in my heart as far as my love is concerned, that it exceeds my love for God. You cannot be mastered by your flesh and by the Spirit, it is one or the other. You cannot serve God and Satan. They are diametrically opposed. There are many pastors who are seeking to be friends with the world, but the scripture clearly tells us that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Jesus said in John 15, 19, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. As Jesus was praying for his disciples and his church in John 17, there in verse 14, Jesus prayed to the Father and he said, I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world.
the world. Paul, writing to the Ephesians, lets us know that the world is governed by Satan. Thus, to be a friend of the world is to be an enemy of God. In Ephesians 2.2, 2, Paul said, In times past, you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air that even now is working in the children of disobedience among whom you all once lived. Walked according to the course of this world but he then tells us who is directing the course of the world. According to the prince of the power of the air. Satan rules over the world today. He is the one that is directing the fads and the fashions of the world. And, and I'm not to love those. I'm not to be caught up with those. I'm not to be enamored by those. Because that would be disloyal to Jesus, whom I'm to love with all my heart and mind and soul and strength. So uh, Jesus said, if I'm a friend of the world, or actually the gospel writer, if you're a friend of the world, then you really are not a friend of Christ. James plainly asserts that if you are a friend of the world, you are an enemy of God. How sad that so many people are trying to live in two worlds. They desire to be friends of God, but they also desire to be friends with the world. You see them in church on Sunday. They're singing the hymns. They're offering their prayers. But the rest of the week, they're trying to find happiness and satisfaction in the things of the world. And they somehow feel that the one hour that they spend in church on Sunday morning surely should suffice it for my relationship with God. Though I pursue my own pleasures and the pleasures of the world, the other 167 hours of the week I have given God his due, I gave him the one hour on Sunday morning. Shouldn't God be happy with that? Well, evidently he isn't. For he said that if you're a friend of the world, you are his enemies. Now, this part I've addressed to the empty seats, not to you. You're here tonight. <laughs> but maybe they'll get the tape. I've heard it said of some people that they are so heavenly minded, they are no earthly good. If you ever find that person, would you please let me know? I would love to meet them. I've never yet met a person that I have felt was so heavenly minded they were no earthly good. I've always found that the more heavenly minded a person was, the, more, the better they were. In fact, I've met an awful lot of people who are so worldly minded they're no heavenly good. And I would rather be the other way around, believe me. So G, uh, James then tells us in verse 5, Do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwells in us desires to envy? Let me give you another translation. That one's a, a, a little bit of a difficulty in, in the translating of that. Let me give you another translation. The Spirit of God that dwells within us. Jealousy desires our full love and devotion. The Lord desires your full love and devotion. The Old Testament portrays God as a jealous God. And especially when Israel turned from him and their love for him and began to worship the other gods and uh, to offer sacrifices to the other gods and uh, made pleasure or sex or these things 
uh, the dominant God of their lives. It provoked God to jealousy in Deuteronomy 32, 16. It says, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods and with their abominations, they provoked him to anger. In Deuteronomy 32, 21, they have moved me to jealousy, the Lord said, because of their love for those which were not God. And they have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. In Exodus 24, again in the Ten Commandments, one of the commandments, you are not to make any graven image or likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God. Exodus 34, 14, for you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Again, in Zechariah 8, 1, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. I wonder if we really understand how deeply and how fully God loves us. He loves you so much. And he wants you to return that love to him. But he loves you so much that if other things come into your heart and life that begin to crowd him out, he gets furious. He's jealous. He wants your love. He loves you so much. He wants your love for him to be full and complete. His jealousy desires are full love and devotion. I think one of the sad passages in the New Testament is found in Paul's sort of closing remarks to Timothy as he is sort of giving some personal insights of his journey and so forth where Paul said, Demas has forsaken me. Having loved this present world, he's departed and gone to Thessalonica. What a sad thing. Demas has forsaken me because he loved this present world. Though John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. He that hath the love of the world in his heart hath not the love of the Father. James tells us that if uh, you know, you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. But unfortunately, Demas isn't alone. There are so many who have forsaken the relationship they once had with the Lord because they've allowed other things to come into their lives and to crowd out that place, that first place that he wants. Peter writes in his second epistle, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the ungodly for the day of judgment to be punished. Mainly those that walk after the flesh and desire an immoral life and they despise order. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas even the angels, which are greater in power and might, do not bring railing accusations against them before the Lord. But these as natural brute beasts, which were created to be taken and destroyed, they speak evil of the things that they do not understand, but they shall utterly perish in their own corruption. 
They shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it a pleasure to riot in the daytime. But they are spots and blemishes as they sport themselves being deceived. And when they feast with you, their eyes are full of adultery and they cannot cease from sin. They beguile unstable souls and in their hearts they have devised covetous practices and they are cursed children which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity as that dumb donkey spoke with a man's mouth to forbid the madness of the prophet. But these are wells without water, clouds that are carried with the tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they appeal through the lust of the flesh and much wantonness to those that have fully escaped from them who live in error. While they promise liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then they are entangled again therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment that was delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has returned to his own vomit and the pig that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. The Lord apprehended us that we might walk in close fellowship and communion with him. With that, God is pleased. And with that, we are fulfilling the very basic purpose of our existence. For I was created for, by him and for him, for his good pleasure. I wasn't really created that I might seek my pleasure, to seek to do my will. But my heart should always be concerned with what would the Lord have me to do? What is his desire for me? In every situation, we should make that sort of a checkpoint. What would the Lord have me to do in this situation? How would the Lord have me to respond? Unfortunately, we don't ask that question so many times, and we are so set on our own ways. We're going to do our own thing. We're going to push our own agenda. And we don't make room for God. We don't stop, and we don't ask the Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do? I want to do that which pleases you. And I found that the Lord has been working in this area in my own life to a great extent, many things. <laughs> I'm glad that the Lord doesn't show me all the flaws at once. I couldn't handle it. But he's, he's gracious. He shows me one at a time, but they keep coming. That's a problem. You know, you just think, well, I've got the victory in that. Praise God. And then he opens up and shows me another. I say, oh, no, you know. And, and, and so it's a constant work. He's always got the signs up under construction. <laughs> but to wean me away from the world, the things of the world, the desires of the world or for the world, so important. He be first. As James is so direct, as I said, ye adulterers and adulteresses. Know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? You can't have it both ways. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world will be an enemy of God. And what a sad thing it is when one leaves their total devotion for Christ. Demas 
no doubt was one, at one time very devoted. He, he left to, to join with Paul and to journey with Paul. Paul calls him in one of his epistles a fellow companion. In, in another epistle, a later epistle, he said, well, Demas is with me. He doesn't call him a fellow servant anymore, but he's still there. But then to Timothy, well, Demas has forsaken me, having loved the world, the things of the world more than the things of God. It, it was a slow, gradual kind of drawing away from the, from the Lord and the things of the Lord. But rather than going that direction, may God help us to come the other direction. May each day find us a little closer, a little more committed, a little more earnest in our love for him and in our devotion for him. What a sad day when someone says, well, where is, you know, it used to be around here, and we have to say, well, you know, it's sort of sad. They've sort of forsaken the Lord. They've gone the way of the world. You know, they're not committed anymore to Jesus Christ. And that's a, that's a sad, sad thing. And may God help us that it will not happen to us. But again, as we said, may we be drawing closer to the Lord. May our love for him be increasing rather than decreasing until we are fully consumed with our love and commitment to him. Father, help us. The world is there with its allurement. Satan makes it look so attractive. And yet, Lord, we realize that to love the world and the things of the world takes away our love for you. And to be a friend of the world is to be an enemy of you. The world that is governed by Satan, directed by him, the world that is attracting so many people and leading them to destruction. Oh God, keep us from the world and the things of the world and keep our hearts ever devoted fully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here at the front to pray for you. The Lord's been speaking to your heart, and maybe the Spirit tonight has just sort of put his finger on some issues where they become more important to you than your relationship with the Lord, or at least they're taking up an awful lot of time, perhaps even more time than what you're giving to the Lord. And the Lord is sort of calling you back to a renewed commitment of love, faithful de faithfulness and devotion to him. They're here to pray for you, so we would encourage you as we're dismissed, just come on down and just say, pray for me. I want the Lord to be first. I don't want the things of this world to crowd out my love for him. My father used to have on his desk a little motto, Lord, never bless me beyond my capacity to contain my love for you. And I thought that was a tremendous motto. Lord, I don't want to be blessed with the earthly things that would ultimately take me away from you, cause me to become so interested in them that my interest for you takes second place. But Lord, I want always to love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. May he not say to us, as with Ephesus, I've got this against you. You've left your first love. But may we walk in love and seek to walk ever closer. May our love for him increase. 
I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound. Yeah. 